Good morning. Welcome you to our service of worship this morning. Glad to have everyone here masked as we are in these times. Uh, I want to call your attention to uh, some announcements that are in the bulletin, of course. Uh, we, uh, the plan is right now is to go back after uh, Memorial Day weekend to uh, two services. The early service will be out in the uh, pavilion. Uh, so we, I know the folks that uh, worship out there really, really like that setting. So we're going to uh, be doing that uh, until weather no longer allows us to do so. Elders, there's a meeting immediately following the service in the McKinney room, so if you'd hang around for that, we would appreciate it very much. We are uh, continuing to talk about uh, the safety protocols and uh, things that we're uh, struggling with as a congregation, so uh, very important meeting, so hope you will be there. Otherwise, uh, on the back, mark your calendars. You'll see various things that are coming up. Uh, and hope you can be a participant in all these. I think Mary did want me to mention, uh, call out the Women's Bible Study, August 23rd, 7 o'clock in the pavilion starting. So uh, I know that's a, that's a good crew. So uh, please make, uh, be aware of that as well. Um, I, I did want to mention just kind of a point of per personal privilege. You know, when I pick, when I pick the hymns, uh, usually they have something to do with the sermon or the theme of the day or the uh, year of the church or something, and uh, a couple of them do today. I just want to mention the, the last hymn, and I appreciate Peter indulging me in this. Uh, my mother passed away in 1999. Uh, she would have been uh, 81 years old uh, this past week. Her two favorite hymns were Amazing Grace, which who doesn't love Amazing Grace, and Shall We Gather at the River. So I appreciate you all indulging me and singing it later in the service. Thank you. Let us turn our attention now to the worship and praise of Almighty God. Please join me in our call to worship. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Blessed are those who strengthen you. Blessed are those who gather in the house of the Lord.
We are called to reflect on our errors and failings, understanding that in confession to God, we are refreshed to a fully open relationship with each other and our Creator. Gracious God, we are those who have inherited the promises first given to Israel. You have included us in the blessing of your salvation, yet we have not loved with the same acceptance of others. You intend that we define ourselves in relationship with you, that we tend to define ourselves by our self-made boundaries. We confess that these boundaries easily become walls of exclusion, prejudice, mistrust, and even hatred. So we now confess fear at the root of our actions, a fear that can only be rooted out at being grounded in your love. We confess with sorrow our failure to love as you love. Forgive us, we pray. Amen. surrounded by love. Indeed, there is no way to escape the wondrous love and unconditional grace of the Lord our God. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. First scripture lesson this morning comes from good old prophet Isaiah, reading from chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge and lift up the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall, shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, his breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall lie with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The, care, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, Nursing childs shall play it over the hole of the snake, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I invite the children to come forward with, I think, a substitute. Is that right this morning?
I recognize this lady. Is it, is it Deborah? Yes, it is, and I need you to come down here and be my special helper. <laughs> come on. You get to hold the microphone. But you get, you get to let me speak. Yeah. <laughs> I have the elders escort her from the building, please. <laughs> Good morning. Inside this bag, I have something that may look ordinary, but it's going to become extraordinary. Does this look pretty ordinary? What do you see? What color is it? It's green. What else can you tell me? Does it look pretty ordinary? Does it just kind of hang there? No? What do you see? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes things in life can seem pretty blah, pretty ordinary, like just any old day. But you, with God's love, can help to make it extraordinary, just like this. Everybody say a prayer, this works. <laughs> Pray harder. What do you see now? It's a bow. It's a bow. Isn't it beautiful? Just like all of you. Now, with God's love, go out and do something and be something beautiful in the world because we all need it, don't we? Okay, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for these children and children everywhere. We pray for their protection, and we pray that you give them strength to do beautiful things in the world. Amen. Second scripture lesson we may have been following along in the book of Ephesians. Uh, I wanted to say something as we conclude today. We believe that <clears throat> this little letter was a circular letter. And by that I mean it wasn't addressed to a particular congregation like Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, you know, for heaven's sakes, could you people get along and dealing with issues in that church? Uh, we believe this was a letter that was addressed to all the churches in the area. And as the cur courier delivered it, wherever, whatever city it was, that's the name you put on it. So it's to the city of Ephesus, it's to the Ephesians. And had he gone to the city of Bronger, to the Brongarians, and to the Millenniums. And, and I know you're thinking, okay, Dr. Strange, what does that mean? Well, it means that, <clears throat> that whatever was going on was affecting all the churches. This is something that was happening to everybody, and we believe that something was uh, an extended war from the year 66 to 73, uh, wherein the Jewish people revolted against the Roman occupation, and it was put down in a very, uh, put down in a very violent way, but the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed. You know, if you were a Roman citizen, you felt like these Jewish people were just, you know, terrorists. If you were Jewish person, you would want to overthrow the oppressor. If you were a small minority Christian group at the time, you'd probably just thought the world's falling apart as you see all of this death and destruction and despair, and you're going through this cultural trauma. So what do you do? 
And as we've seen, the author says, well, let's look at what Christ has done for us. Christ has brought peace into a violent world. Christ has brought unity into a divided world and brought hope into a world that looks very uncertain. And he says, hold on to that. Live that, as dark as it may seem. And it may also explain why he reaches for this military imagery as he concludes his letter, thinking about perhaps a Roman soldier. Finally, after three therefores, we're getting to a finally. And a finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the spiritual powers of darkness, the forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of evil. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication. Peace be to the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are those Christian groups and <clears throat> groups in every religion that seem to relish this kind of battle imagery, military imagery for the life of faith. They say we are in the war for the soul of Christianity and we must defeat the infidels, the unbelievers, because they seem to think that they and they alone have the truth, so we must stand up and fight against a clearly defined enemy. And there are those of us, and I would consider myself in this group, that find that kind of language increasingly uncomfortable as it has been used to justify crusades and holy wars and jihads and genocide in the name of Jesus. But I'll be honest, as I reflected on these words this week and thought about where we are right now as a nation and a world, I have to admit being in a battle is how it feels. It's just how it existentially feels right now. And we use that language, of course, so-and-so is battling addiction or so-and-so is battling cancer. But we find ourselves battling, battling this unseen virus which won't seem to dissipate. And we're tired and we're exhausted. And we have nurses and healthcare workers, we say, on the front lines. Parents battling school boards. And we all seem to be battling against ignorance and misinformation. Seeing the effects of the remnants of battles in Afghanistan. The poor people of Haiti seem to be once again battling nature. Retired pastor John Buchanan in an old sermon has a wonderful description of not just the battles we face, these big cosmic battles, but just as he says, the day-to-day -day battles that we face. And he said, we know what those battles are about. The daily struggle with the hurried busyness of our lives, our captivity to our possessions, our slavery to success and winning at all costs. 
Some of us battle crushing poverty. Some contend with crushing affluence. Some battle addiction. Some battle demons of self-doubt and guilt. Some battle memories of broken relationships. Some battle depression. Others battle lingering grief. And some are in a life and death struggle with disease, mustering the courage to get out of bed and go to the radiation lab at 7 o'clock in the morning to do battle another day. Now battles, those battles keep us struggling because then we have to battle despair and cynicism and all the things that come with it. So when the author says we need to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his power, we want to say, yeah, I'll, I'll have some of that, please. It's scary out there, he says. I kind of wish he had written a letter in reverse, had started with this, you know, and said, look, it's scary out there. All of these things are happening. Therefore, live this way and then end with the first chapter. But Christ has won. We have the victory. Leave, a, you know, leave on a high note. But he speaks this way intentionally, perhaps. It is a battle at times. But he says to all of these churches out there, we are not defenseless. We have weapons to use. By the way, all the imagery is defensive. It's not offensive. It's stuff to protect yourself. Even the sword is the word of the God, is the word of God, the spirit. And he gives this whole list of things which Maybe some of them resonate with us at different times and maybe not. I remember the first time that I talked about this passage six years ago, and obviously you all remember that sermon very well. I didn't even mention the belt of truth. But now, when has truth become such a thing? And I'm so aware of the last few weeks and months, how often the Bible speaks of truth. Speak the truth in love. Speak truth to your neighbors. Wrap around you the belt of truth. Why does it seem to jump out at us at the time in which we live? Maybe it rises as we also see the rise of such spin and propaganda and the conspiracy theories which fill our airways. Followers of Christ are committed to the truth, the truth of science, the truth of who we are, the truth of who God is. Put on, he says, the breastplate of righteousness. And I don't know about you, but when I hear the word righteous, some reason I want to put self in front of it, self-righteous, and I define the word just by that. In fact, I think if I were to ask you, you know, Describe your Christian journey. I'm not sure any of, you, any of you would say, well, first of all, Brother Bjorn, I, uh, I'm a righteous person. No. But you should, perhaps. Because in the scriptures, righteousness means right living. Living right, not as an individual adhering to some kind of puritanical moral code, but as a community. As Daniel... Or, I read it, didn't I? As Daniel was going to read in Isaiah, God will judge the world with righteousness. The poor, poverty, as if, as if to say righteousness, right living, is to address the social evils as best we can as God's people in the world. With all of our affluence, why is there poverty? Why are there poor? Why are, why are there homelessness? Righteousness calls us to address these, to work against these. Put on your feet the gospel of peace. Why do we not wage peace with the same fervor that we wage war? Take up the shield of faith, the author says. 
which is interesting. I'm, I'm sure he put these things together on purpose. The shield is not something you wear. It's something you hold on to. Hold on to faith. Holding on to faith allows you to take, he believes, everything the world throws at you. Is that just preacher talk? Perhaps. But he believes faith is that shield of protection that in the end holds on to us. Put on the helmet of salvation, he says. Salvation is our protection. And he's already told us we have an inheritance in heaven. It's there. We don't have to struggle, worry, do we get in, do we not get in? There's a couple people on this side over here that haven't heard my Mabel story, so I'm going to tell my Mabel story <laughs> just for those. And somebody who's listening later by, on the West Coast, <clears throat> my very first pastoral visit the very first church was to a lady named Mabel. She was 82 years old. She had cataracts. And I went to see her, and she was a blessed lady. And she asked me at that time, she was really worried about whether she was good enough to get into heaven. All the members of her family were in a denomination that felt that that was the goal of the Christian life, only to get people into heaven, and they had her stressed out about it. And I'm thinking at the time, you know, Mabel's a saint. She's 82. She's got cataracts. Good Lord, if she doesn't get into heaven, whew, I'm in big trouble. And she asked me about it, and I said something. I don't know what I said. I didn't know what to say. I said something flipping like, well, I don't guess any of us are good enough to get into heaven. I had occasion to see her two weeks later. And she asked me again in such a way that I thought, this, this is stressing her. She's, she's worried about this. So I did what any young pastor who knows nothing would do. I got a copy of John Calvin's Institutes, and I brought them over to her, and we looked at some passages with having to do with predestination and election, and the gist being... Salvation is in God's hands. The goal of the Christian life is not to get saved every week. Salvation brings joy and peace, not stress and consternation. And then Miss Mabel said to me, honest to God, she looked at me and she says, so instead of worrying about whether or not I've been saved, I should be thankful that I have been. Yeah. <laughs> You go, girl, yes. No theologian has ever said that better. Have an inheritance in heaven. It is that helmet that, we, that protects us. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Since there was no Bible as we know it at this time, the Word of God is everything that comes from God, God's presence, God's spirit, God's love. Love is our weapon. Love is our weapon, which is good because our enemies are not flesh and blood. And maybe as this author, as this community, these churches are looking and seeing the fighting, the destruction in this flesh and blood going at each other, dying, they're asking why, but why is it at that point? Why, what is it that we're fighting? And I think for me in our current time, this is one of the most important messages, maybe in the New Testament. Our enemies are not flesh and blood. They're not people. It's what he calls spiritual forces of evil. It's anything that opposes God's vision for the world. Enemies are ways of thinking that twist people and distort their humanity. Racism, sexism, injustice. To dehumanize people. Enemies are religious intolerance and bigotry and prejudice. 
Hate is the enemy with his little brother fear and big brother death. And the author has already said hate and death and evil have been defeated. And I wonder how the church has heard that. Did they look at the world and go, hmm, so Christ has brought peace to a violent world, has brought unity to a divided world, brought hope into a world uncertain about its future. You know what? I don't see it. <laughs> I don't see it. And I think the author is saying, don't, don't see it, be it. Be it. There was a New Testament scholar in the last century, German scholar, Oscar Kuhlmann. He was talking one time about how we square our faith and its more optimistic elements with the reality of evil in the world. How do we come from Easter in which we say, evil and sin and death have been defeated. Christ rules, reigns victorious. Good Lord, that's not how it looks out there. How do we square that? And so he used an example from his own time. He was close to World War II, and so he used the example of D-Day, the invasion of Normandy. I'm not a history buff of, of military history, but from what I understand from those who are historians and military scholars that the Battle of Invasion of Normandy, D-Day, was so successful that it was apparent that the U.S.-led allies would win the war. The writing was on the wall after that. There would still yet be more battles to be fought. There would be more death and destruction that would follow. But again, it was like, this is, this is going to happen. There is an inevitability there. And so Dr. Kuhlman said for the New Testament, for our Christian journey, for the writers in particular, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ was D-Day. It signaled that the, the big war had been won. And yet there would be battles, there would be battles to be fought. The daily struggles that we go through, the big paddle battles with the things as we are encountering even now. That hate will always look for an opportunity to rear its ugly head, and it will have some successes. But Dr. Kuhlman said, the writing's on the wall. And that writing says, love has won. And nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from that love. This author does not, I think, try to downplay the reality of evil in our lives, in our world, does not try to downplay the battles that we face and how overwhelming they seem at times, but neither will he downplay the absolute cosmic significance of what God has done in Christ and its continuing transformative effect in our lives and in our world. Peace in a violent world, unity in a divided world, hope in a world with an uncertain future. So he says, live with courage, live with joy, live with hope. Enjoy the blessings of your life and be a blessing to others. Hallelujah and amen.
Please join me now in our affirmation of faith found in your bulletin. God has not taken his people out of the world, but has sent them into the world to worship God there and serve all mankind. We worship God in the world by standing before the Lord in behalf of all people. Our cries for help and our songs of praise are never for ourselves alone. Worship is no retreat from the world. It is part of our mission. We serve humankind by discerning what God is doing in the world and joining God in that work. We risk disagreement and error when we try to say what God is doing here and now. But we find guidance in God's deeds in the past and in God's promises for the future, as they are witnessed to in Scripture. We affirm that the Lord is at work, especially in events and movements that free people by the gospel and advance justice, compassion, and peace. Please be seated. Join me in prayer. God, our creator, you made all things in your wisdom and in your love, you save us. We pray for the whole creation. Overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong, feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made and joyfully sing your praises. You sent us a savior, Jesus Christ, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn nation against nation and race against race. Speed the day when wars will end and the whole world accepts your rule. Stand with those who sorrow, that they may be sure that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come shall separate them from your love. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick, cheer them by your word, and bring healing as a sign of your grace. We ask these and all things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose words we now commemorate as one, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You'll find the friendship registers in the ends of the pew if you'll sign those and pass those along and turn your thoughts and minds toward offering.
God, we do indeed thank you for all your wondrous gifts. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for this community of faith. We thank you for the gift of faith, which holds on to us when we are tired and feel like we can't hold on. And we thank you for your amazing grace, which flows through our lives, giving us always more cause to rejoice than to feel sad. And so we thank you for that grace and pray that it flows through us to those places where you would lift up. In Christ's name, amen.
sisters, go forth as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ and trust that the power and spirit and goodness and grace of the love will go with you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.